Hello, and welcome to yet a bon- another bonus episode. Nailed it, baby. Good. Yeah. <laughs> fuck it, we'll do it live. We'll do uh, it live. We'll just fuck, <laughs> we'll fucking go, and we'll do it live. <laughs> Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and with me today is obviously Liam of the Lions Led by, or the Liam's Led by Donkeys podcast. <laughs> Liam's Led by Donkeys. Yeah, uh, I don't know if, uh, am I co-host? What am I, what am I, man? Yeah, I would say you're a co-host. Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, hi. You may also know me from, uh, well, there's your problem. Uh, the best podcast about engineering disasters that's not produced by those fuckwits over at NPR. They they do an engineering disasters podcast? No, dude, they do 99% invisible. And, like, we'll get YouTube comments that are like, uh, why isn't this as well produced as 99% invisible or an NPR <laughs> podcast? It's like, because it's fucking Roz doing it. Like, Roz it's is editing it. NPR. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have the budget for that. Like, we have Roz, man. He does his best. Like, he has to, like, go through line by line and be like, oh, Liam threatened to, like, bleep somebody. (laughs) Actionable violence. Actionable violence, allegedly. Like, it's just Roz doing it. We don't have a sound editor. Yeah, I mean, I do have a sound editor, and bless Nate's heart. Um, Like, he has to deal with all of our bullshit all of of the time. Um, So, like... We're not NPR, and also we would never make it on NPR. Um, no, I I listen. The one time we were featured in the Boston Globe, I was just like, "Oh, you're in the Boston Globe, yeah, dude." The chief <laughs> ballet dancer, no joke. The chief uh, male ballerina of the Boston Globe, a man named Patrick Yocum, uh, gave a. They did a little tiny write up on us because he's like. He's a chief ballet. He's a chief. He's a principal dancer of the Boston Ballet, and he was like, "Recommend this podcast." Well, there's your problem. And that was like a year ago. And I was just like some asshole at the Boston Globe with a journalism BA had to like sit through an episode and be like, "What the <laughs> fuck is this?" That was uh, that happened to us on. Um, it wasn't Gawker because Gawker's dead, but it was one of like the side websites of Gawker. I think it was uh, IO Live or something like that. Uh, oh, IO Nine. Was- io9 maybe gave us a shout out uh because of our episode on robert e lee and uh it was really weird uh because like then like some serious journalism boy had to sit through an episode which has happened before like the the once upon a time at the university of um north carolina chapel hill um our podcast was curriculum (laughs) for for a class oh my god (laughs) Uh, it uh, was regarding the Iran Iraq war, and uh, so like I didn't a good know series, that. Man. Yeah, I'm. I'm still. It's like the. It's still the thing. I'm not, that and the Khmer Rouge series are the things I'm, I'm most proud of. Um, but like I went there to like go on a book tour, effectively, and so I was like, yeah, to listen to your podcast for school. I'm like you were aware you're in college, right? Like, <laughs> oh, dude, we get. We've gotten people who are like, yeah, I'm an adjunct and like I'm using like Bo Paul in, 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 you know, in my lecture or whatever. And I'm just like, okay, very serious like discussion of like the evils of unchecked capitalism. Uh, also baked in there are like jokes about my dick. Like, yes, like I, I think I did some of my best research in Iran, Iraq um, and Soviet Afghan. But like also, I think the Iran, Iraq war series is where i came up with the like the local dick sucking factory joke yeah so it's like well, we've stolen shit. that joke too <laughs> we it's have fine. shamelessly it's stolen that joke yeah that's right it's, fine. it's, the, it's, it's a, the nape of the one, union one big union baby uh <laughs> speaking of one big union uh we're talking about japanese holdouts of world war ii oh well, that's uh, that's a hell of a segue man I would like to think that they, before they all died of old age, I think uh, they had a union uh, to represent, I don't know, being weird and living in the jungle. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to take this to my union rep. Can somebody ask when my sword and my Mark 99 back? <laughs> I'm hanging out with my grandson on Thursday. <laughs> back in my day, when I was living in the jungle and living on uh, like stolen rice and gunpowder, uh, and killing you know, we... like thirty farmers. I read that. I read that today in prep. He killed like thirty farmers, and then fucking Franco gives him a pardon anyway. <laughs> Not Franco. Uh, Ferdinand. What is it? Marcos, the dictator. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, if anybody is on the side of killing thirty innocent civilians, it's Ferdinand Marcos. It is Marcos. That's not wrong. 
Uh, so I think one of the reasons why I was so drawn to the story, other than the fact that like people requested it all the time, and it's interesting, like it's weird, it's funny, uh, like what, and, and I think a lot of it is um, misunderstood. Uh, you know, we want to look as you know these guys are so slavishly loyal to the emperor that they stayed um, holding out in the forests and the jungles for weeks and months and years and decades after the end of World War II. Um, I don't think it's that easy, uh, especially which is why I took I, I chose two main people uh, to talk about today because they are polar opposites of one another. Um, one is someone that you obviously looked up, and I think most people immediately jumps to their mind if you Google like Japanese holdout of World War II. He's probably the first one that comes up, and his name's Hiro Odena. Uh, and but this is not an isolated incident, uh, just to be clear. This happened... If the Japanese invaded an island during World War II... There were there dudes hanging pro- out on it, yeah. There was yeah, probably that people that stayed behind. Uh, like, there was some in Guam, which is not that far, uh, really, where I am right now. Uh, despite the fellow... We don't talk about him, but, like, he held out in Guam for, for quite a long time. And then uh, when, he, when people found him, uh, he knew the war had been over. He just, just didn't want, want to like, come out. Didn't want, didn't want to go home. He was just like, "Fuck it, I'm a hermit now." Yeah, I like, guess. I, you know, I feel like at some point you're just like, I can't go home to my family. Uh, I maybe I felt like I've derelicted my duty. Like I'm just gonna stay on this fucking rock, bro. Like I don't. Yeah. Like I get not wanting to go home. Like I get the idea that like you had lived this life previously, and now whatever post war Japan is sort of a different animal. And especially if you yes. get so f- so far sucked into like imperial propaganda, and then like you watch maybe newsreel footage of the atom bombs dropping, like that's not gonna feel good. Like I'm not saying like you know fuck imperial Japan, obviously not an imperial Japan defender, but like that's not gonna feel good to watch two of your home cities absolutely reduced to smoke. God, I really wish in response that I like the Imperial March is like a drop, but I don't have it. Uh, you know, and like that's that's true. Uh, some of it is obviously Imperial propaganda, which is the case of Hero Odin. I will talk about. Um, and a lot of it is the like the family shame aspect. Like when Hero Odin surrendered, he still had a knife on him that was given to him by his own mother to kill himself yeah, I with. Saw rather than that. Be I saw so it's that. like a lot of and like, you know, that is a lot of these guys. Um, you know, there's a lot of POWs. Uh, I'm granted there wasn't a ton of Japanese POWs in World War II, but there, but the ones that did go home, like even though like the imperial cult effectively had been kind of broken, uh, people were given a little bit more freedoms. You know, the the emperor kind of sort of said he was not in fact a deity, but he used this you know uh, language gymnastics to kind of get around that. But like their families were still like, no, fuck you, <laughs> like oh shit, okay. Um, but that's like, like that fucking sucks dude like you're just like i just want to go home and live a normal life and i can't because my own fucking family doesn't want to talk to me like that blows ass and, and so and that kind of happened in like uh, on you know on the allied side that happened in the soviet union during world war ii as oh well. yeah uh, though that was much more state enforced shame culture than you know <laughs> locally it's it's different but it, we were- same but different <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> just oh. Uh, so this happens so much uh, in the, w- these outlying areas of the fallen Japanese empire or the crumbling Japanese empire at this point uh, that the Japanese coined a term for it as Zenryu Nippon High, which meant the remaining Japanese soldiers. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, it's, coi- like, it's like the Imperial Remnant from Star Wars. Come <laughs> exactly. on, man. <laughs> Now, I did, like I said, I picked two uh, guys to talk about because the holdouts are not a monolith. And I really don't want, I really hate the concept that is very popular, um, especially in the United States, uh, because, you know, propaganda, that uh, Japanese soldiers were some kind of uh, robotic automatons. And they, like, just slavingly followed uh, what they consider to be the, the, the dictates of the empire. And it's not, it's not that easy. Like we talked about during our Kamikaze series, and a lot of that same stuff will come up here. Um, so Hiro Odena was born in 1922 in a small village called Kamikawa. Uh, not a lot is known about his childhood, uh, though it is kind of figured that he was pretty rich and well off and, and had a very good education. A lot of this is because his dad worked in import-export, um, which 
is a joke that I think I've said before is like whenever anybody says they they work in import export, they're e- they're like either a work for like the British East India Company or they're a drug dealer. That dude is doing some <laughs> shady shit. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, you can tell because he uses his connections he got through his job to get his son a job in Wuhan, China, uh, a city that thankfully will never become important again in any no, reason. No, not newsworthy for any reason. No, don't look it up. Nope. <laughs> nope. nope. Nothing <laughs> bad has happened there. Not, everything's fine. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, Odina turned 18 and he went back to Japan. And this is where, like, depending on who you talk to, uh, he either voluntarily enlisted in the Japanese Imperial Army or was drafted. Um, I think he was on it. He honestly enlisted because he became an officer and he got into a very prestigious school, which probably had a lot to do with his dad. Uh, he got into the Nakato school, which is kind of like a very specific officer's academy, but for intelligence nerds. Um, oh, oh boy. <laughs> and this was not a normal school. Um, it was incredibly highly selective and unique. It taught students survival skills, infiltration skills, airborne operations, seaborne operations, foreign languages, and guerrilla tactics. The graduates of the school were the, like uh, kind of like the Japanese equivalent of Navy SEALs. And I don't use that that uh that comparison lightly because they also have the war crimes to be. I was going to be, is this a war crimes <laughs> joke? Like I'm ready for it. I, I low hanging fruit guys. Sorry. Um, yeah. Just to underline how selective the school was, it's kind of hard to get an exact measure of how many people were in the Japanese Imperial army during world war two, because you know, a lot of them were just simply never found. Uh, and they, and, and a lot of the records were evaporated in firebombing and atomic what, what, hellfire. What, what happened there? Uh, it was a completely paper, natural fire. Yeah, it was weird. Paper, Tokyo paper burned, burned down. Very suspiciously. We don't know what happened. I was always interested that people, had, like, for good reason, talk about the, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as war crimes. Yeah. But, like, no one ever fucking talks about the firebombings of Tokyo. They're just right. like, yeah, like, don't, don't worry about that. Like, this is always a sore point for my dad. But he was just like, that was a war crime. Like, we're just not talking about it. Well, sure, is the strate- so is the strategic bombing of Europe. Uh, but, you know, since the guys who won did it, yeah. it's just something we don't talk about. Yeah, you can't uh, do war crimes when you win. That's how it works. Yeah, that's right. The Dr- Dresden was that way when we showed up. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you, we, what we do well, we know is... the cathedral looks better now. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, by 1945 in World War II, there were at least 6 million people in uniform. So it's, it's a lot. Um, but of those during the entire war, only 2,500 people ever graduated from the school. Holy shit. Yes. Uh, so uh, how it's long actually, was the school open for? Uh, uh, the entire war, mostly. So like, are we talking like 41, 45 or like 33, 34 to 45? I think 40s. Uh, I, I think they okay. saw like the flaws that their training had in regards to the Sino-Japanese War, uh, and yeah. realized like, hey, we we kind of need commandos too. And you know, to be fair, most people don't think of Japan as like deploying commandos places. Um, I don't know why. I guess it goes against the the popular narrative of them attacking and screaming human waves and shit. That they actually had some very highly trained secret squirrel people, but you know, whatever. So that's 500 people a year. Roughly, the thing uh, is, is is the the length of the school has never been quite nailed down. Um, oh, gotcha. Okay, because he enlisted when he was eighteen, um, and then graduated several years later. Got uh, it. So, like, I I think maybe it had to, like he was a Futama class commando is what it was known as, and there was other classes of commandos that probably didn't take as long to train, but he was one of the best. Uh, he graduated in 1944 which is damn near the end of the war um, yeah. which like i guess depending on who you are good um but you know he unfortunately doesn't get to ride out the entire war and uh he is sent to uh the island of lubang in the philippines to for a very specific reason uh in military terms you call these guys force multipliers uh what you're supposed to do uh that's actually what the green berets were originally for uh, like you send them to an area and they train locals to uh, you send a very small number of them to an area to train locals to, you know, 
blow up the numbers effectively. Like mm -hmm. you send one Futama commando to the island of Lubang, which has a Japanese garrison still, a very, very small one, but they still have one. And you could take these, you know, five or six dudes and train them to be like jungle commandos, right? Um, because like yeah, this wasn't normal training the Japanese army got. Uh like people like, oh, they were great jungle fighters. Like, no, they were just defending and they happened to be in a jungle. Like they didn't get specialized guerrilla warfare training unless they had a Futama commando nearby. So like their their his job was to go to Lubang, turn these guys into like a hit and run master class of guerrilla warfare, and then wait for the allies to show up. Sure. But Unfortunately, Lu Bang was considered a kind of an unimportant island in the grand scheme of the Allied island hopping campaign. So they kind of skipped over it. Um, they did land there, but it was more of a like, we're here, you know. Um, but they did fully invade the nearby island of Mindoro, uh, which the Japanese really didn't try to defend that hard. They deployed a couple kamikazes. Uh, it, at this point, it was pretty obvious that, that they were fucked, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the the uh, the American forces have already landed at Leyte, uh, and it wasn't going to be terribly too long until the Philippines as a whole would fall completely back into Allied hands. In February of 1945, American forces did land on Lubang, and Odara met uh, meant to grab his guys, scamper off into the jungle, and do all that cool shit he was trained to do. Sure, but he was stopped by several officers who outranked him. Him being only a lieutenant. And uh, they thought that fighting in such a way was incredibly dishonorable. Uh, and instead, uh, like they were either going to have to fight the Americans or do what else, but kill themselves. Good guys, you don't <laughs> always have to resort to suicide. Like they believe that like just seeing the Americans land on the island was like, oh, we failed. Uh, I guess womp, we have to kill womp. ourselves. Like, yeah. That doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you know? You're just like, A, you're, you're supposed to do some spook squirrel shit, so go do the spook squirrel shit. Or B, like, I don't know, have the decency to fight to the last man, you pussies. Remember, kids, at first you don't succeed, kill yourself kill so it yourself, doesn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> Die for the emperor! <laughs> <laughs> taking that knife your mom gave you to stab yourself with and like missing your artery and just being like what the fuck what oh, am that, I doing uh, man? that reminds me of um, it was uh, Hideki Tojo the prime minister during most of World War II shot himself in the chest and then survived that's just embarrassing <laughs> man yeah he tried to kill himself uh, as Americans came to arrest him the Americans gave him first aid because legally you have to right even if you're you fully plan on executing this man. They nursed him back to health and then hung him. <laughs> you know. Owned. Fucking owned. 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 Uh, but seeing this, Odina's superior, guy named Major Yoshimi Tanaguchi, ordered his guys to stop fucking killing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> guys, stop. Fucking I would you just stop? Kill them, not yourselves. Them? Yes. Like, like pointing to like a crudely drawn American diagram. Them, not you. Everybody, <laughs> them, not you. The the Arasaka rifle, much like the Ross rifle, would sometimes fire directly backwards into their own face. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> now, the major knew that you know they had orders to hold this island as long as possible, and the best way to do that would be to deploy guerrilla tactics and fuck up everybody's shit. Now, him and the rest of the command staff, uh, Tanaguchi and the command staff, I mean, left Odina being the commando in charge of the island and the men that they would give them. And then they promised that they would come back for him. Uh, but until they got back, they, uh, by no means were they allowed to kill themselves or surrender, right? They were given a very explicit order. And in case you're thinking that, like, Odina was given charge of, like, a platoon or a company, four guys... He was given oh. four dudes. Oh. <laughs> like, We're the I mean, four best friends that <laughs> anyone could have. Oh, God. Like, he was given a huge stockpile of ammo. So, like, credit where credit's due, I guess. But, yeah, that's it. Not great. <laughs> Not great. I don't like his odds. Um, he was then ditched by his commander on the random Philippine island of Lubang. Now, Odina 
to his credit, at no point, like, because he wrote a book, I, I read translations of it. It never really seemed like he was like, yeah, all this is hopeless. Fuck this. I'm going to go sit in the woods until someone comes and gets me. He just like immediately went to work. He began reconning enemy forces and civilians in preparation for the coming attacks. He was sure were going to come into the forest and try to get him out of there. Uh, and he was also planning for his attacks, which he did carry out. Unlike several holdouts, which is true. A lot of holdouts just like, fuck off. I'm sitting in these jungles the until Japan right. comes back. Yeah. He did not. Um, he stalked through the woods and found targets and continued the war. One of the first things he did was decide that in order to keep the island in Japanese hands, which, by the way, it was not anymore, uh, no. he would he would need to deprive food from the enemy, which meant burning farms and rice fields to deprive oh. them of food. Who's asymmetrical warfare now? <laughs> Just running through rice paddies. <laughs> <laughs> which is like a huge dick move if you happen yeah, to be the local so Philippine stupid. farmers. <laughs> if you're substance Come on, bro, that's my rice. Uh, where am I supposed to eat? <laughs> <laughs> and like the, the Japanese occupation of the Philippines is pretty fucking brutal already. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, really? So like these guys are like, finally, I can rebuild and these assholes aren't going to come steal my crops. Why is everything on fire? <laughs> now... It did not take long for the few allies, uh, Filipino uh, cops and soldiers and civilians on the islands to figure out they're like, oh, there's still Japanese soldiers out there somewhere. Burning uh, our shit like a bunch of dicks. Yeah. Uh, and when the war ended in August of 1945, Odinov found his first clue left for him that the war might be over. During a raid on a nearby farm with his guys, they killed a cow for food. And behind it, on a farm, they found a poster nailed to the wall. And it read, the war ended August 15th. Come down from the mountains. Now, if this seems like it might be a trap, congratulations, you might be a lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial Army. Oh, for God's uh, Oden- sakes. <laughs> They picked Odina. a date and everything. <laughs> right, right. Now, Odina immediately began to doubt this flyer for reasons oh, that are convenient. very stupid. That's convenient. Now, the, it, now, it's not. It's actually, this is the dumbest way he disregards this. Later on, he might actually have some good reasons. Ah. Uh, but this is, this is the dumb, dumbest flyer he disregards uh, for the dumbest reason. So... Remember, these guys are all armed with rifles and grenades. They're raiding local farms, setting shit on fire. Uh, This is happening so often that extra police have been stationed nearby, uh, which, of course, led to shootouts with the cops and armed civilians who had picked up like disregarded uh, or discarded rifles. Um, Odina, the ranking officer, decided the flyer had to be an enemy ploy because if the war was over, why were people still shooting at him? Uh, because you're in their <laughs> house, man. You're stealing their shit. Yeah, you're taking stuff. That that's yeah. People have the right to self defense, my guy. Yes, uh, that's a, I, that's this is your braid on Imperial Japan shit. <laughs> I assume that I'm shooting at the ghosts coming out of the jungle in the middle of the night Ooh. and setting my rice crops on fire. Um, but that was not the only time they were contacted. By late 1945, the knowledge of holdouts. Just random soldiers at the edges of the fallen Japanese empire became commonplace throughout uh, Allied-occupied Japan. Allies got former Japanese generals to pen letters so they could be dropped from aircraft into areas where the soldiers were still hiding. Americans figured that if the soldiers actually got orders from an officer, they would listen to them because they believed, and they were mostly right, that not obeying would be considered dishonorable to them. Here's where they ran into a small problem. The generals were not writing these orders themselves. Instead, they were dictated and then pumped out by American occupation forces via a translator. Oh, no. And then, uh, oh, and, no. And then they were signed by these generals. Odina was almost certainly the best trained Japanese soldier to be hiding out. There's little doubt of that. And he was naturally going to be suspicious about anything. So, say, a small error would immediately make him doubt everything he was being told. Which is what happened when a translator fucked up the flyers being dropped on his island. It left several spelling errors in place. So Odina took one look at it and figured this had to be made by Americans. Therefore, it's a trap. Which, well, yes, but no. Which tracks. <laughs> yeah, like that one is, is makes the most sense. That's a fair it's point. A trap. Yeah. Yeah, like this is obviously like psyops before psyops mm-hmm. are really a thing, you know? 
Unfortunately for Odin, over the years, all of the soldiers he was with would eventually leave him. They're running off into the jungle or would be killed in battle with the local cops. Uh, one man, Yukuchi Akatsu. I tried, guys. Sorry. Uh, uh, to our loyal Japanese listeners, you should expect this of me. Uh, yeah. Sorry, everybody. Uh, was with the group until 1949, uh, until they had an argument and he went off into the jungle on his own. Uh, now, like, this has seemed to be more, uh, the way that Odin us, like, explains it, it really seems to be more of, like, they had an argument and uh, Akatsu was like, fuck you, I'm gonna go take a walk, I'll be back. Uh, but Odin us saw this as a security lapse, so he uprooted the rest of the group's operation and moved it across the jungle so uh, Akatsu couldn't rat them out to the authorities. Then Akatsu couldn't find them, so he turned himself in in 1950. So he was oh out God. on his own for a year. <laughs> Fuck that, man. Yeah, I get killed yourself at some point. It's something new to do. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of bored. I guess I could shoot myself. Uh, the, all the officers did it. Um, and like at this point, like the, the Philippine authorities were really sick of these guys um, for obvious reasons, right? Understandably. Um, and we're like, look, man, leave a letter. Uh, we'll like nail it to a tree or something uh, that says like, hey, surrender. Everybody's cool here, right? Uh, and so we did. And uh, Odina immediately figured that he'd been like turned and tortured and like forced oh to make this God. letter. Uh, <laughs> so a- after that, Akatsu just went home. Uh, he was flown back uh, to Japan. <laughs> understandably. So like, nah, man, I tried. <laughs> Fuck that. Give me my pension, yo. <laughs> now uh the japanese government tried harder and harder to get odina to surrender right uh at this point it was like fuck man we still have this guy out there he's shooting at people and like the philippine government's pressuring them to do something about these guys that are out in the jungle uh like come on man you drop this psycho out here and he's still running around killing people decades later for the love of god come get him um now the philippines military and police we're also trying to find him independent of Japan, right? Like Japan is sending people to um, to the Philippines to try to contact him. Meanwhile, uh, the military and police and like the Philippine intelligence and stuff are stalking this tiny. Uh, the island is not that big. Uh, looking for this guy and uh, like getting in gunfights with uh, Odin and his men more and more. Uh, and then like airplanes started dropping letters and pictures from the families. Uh, again, the group believed this to be like an American lie or propaganda somehow. So they, they had photos of the families, though, and were just like, yes. here's your family. Don't you want to come home? And they said, no, we'd rather be difficult about it. <laughs> it's really hard to like pinpoint what he thought about like how they got these letters, except that the Americans must have invaded Japan. Um, but like or that like the 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 government that's now in Japan is occupied and therefore illegitimate illegitimate which, yeah but it's really hard to pin down cuz Odinot was under the impression that World War II was still going on even mm-hmm. though it was now the mid 1950s um it, it really seems now like when well he's dead now but like it, in his dying days when he was trying to explain is like i was confused man <laughs> like uh he 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 he, he's kind of inconsistent but like i don't fucking know the brain breaks at some point like you you can justify or or sort of excuse anything when you right right yeah if if i was him i would be worried about turning myself into the philippine cops at this point sure Like, like i've killed 30 people like yes I've been killing civilians and burning rice crop down for 15 fucking years. I don't think these guys are going to be nice to me. Um, But as the 1950s wore on, the group of now three men fought on in the jungle. Everyone on the island knew they were out there somewhere. And attacks have become so commonplace over the years that fishermen wouldn't even go out to tend their lines without carrying a rifle with them. Like he had like. This guy had uh, fundamentally created like a Fallout universe where everybody has to carry a gun everywhere they're going, or raiders will come and get them. <laughs> I played New Vegas, you know. Uh, I just I love the idea of like uh, this sort of like not obviously in like a, a harmful, a harmless, mischievous way, but sort of like peas from Harry Potter, like a poltergeist. And you're just like, <laughs> damn you, on and on, just like shooting at the field. <laughs> Clutching your like, fist and like shooting a Mark ninety nine just at <laughs> the sky. 
<laughs> Every time something goes wrong around the field, you just assume it's the guy in the jungle. Understandably, you're trying to war. You're you're, you're turning it into like the uh, oh god, so it's like boogeyman myth. Keep your kids in line, or Odinah's gonna snatch you. And Odinah pops up. It's like you guys got rice. <laughs> Let me get some of that rice, bro. Can I get some of uh, the rice? You know, honestly, you're not too far off, but we'll touch back on that towards the end, right? Um, eventually, a, a fisherman shot a member of the team, plugging Corporal Shiichi Shimada in the leg during a firefight over some fish. Uh, suddenly, it, it, it dawned on uh, on me here, right? This guy is a corporal. Uh, these guys think they've been fighting at a front of World War II for uh, about a decade now, but none of them have been promoted, right? <laughs> I don't I don't know if Odina had the authority to do this. Um like, I thought my move, man. I thought my army career is kind of bad, but goddamn Shimada here had been a corporal for like 12 fucking years. <laughs> like goddamn dude. Nobody's going to ask any questions. Uh it's like he he was thrown into a special level of hell for corporals everywhere who have angered the gods somewhere. Uh but Odina dragged Shimada away from the firefight and nursed him back to health. Uh, I assume by shoveling dirt or some shit into the bullet hole, because according to Odina, they did not have uh, any medical supplies. They've been left behind all sorts of ammo and grenades and stuff, but like no medical supplies. Um, That's a dick move. Huge oversight, honestly. (laughs) Uh, I mean, granted, medical supplies, even from World War II, were just like, here, have a bandage. I don't know. There's not, there's not a lot there. Here's some uh, morphine. Good luck. Yeah, do drugs. Don't get shot. Um, <laughs> that's actually my, my, my life motto. Do drugs. Don't get shot by uh, farmers. The only dope worth shooting is Richard Nixon. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, Shimada recovered and uh, eventually was killed at a sh- shootout by the cops in 1953. Oh, Christ. He was 40 years old. <laughs> What a uh, the group eight years. <laughs> yeah, what a horrible way to end your life. Yeah. Um, the group is now down to just Odina and Private First Class Kenichi Kazuka. Uh, despite oh, poor, the- this poor guy, this yeah. poor PFC. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing here, man? I want to go home. It is now the 1970s. Why can I at least be a corporal? <laughs> this is how I burnt my 30s. <laughs> Uh, despite the 50s turning into the 60s and then the 70s, these two guys continued fighting the war. The two men fought with cops snuck out at night to torch crops and still thinking they were hurting the enemy rather than just some farmers who are really just over their shit at this point. Now, uh, during one of their operations that burned some rice in 1972, Kazuka was killed by police. He had been fighting World War II for 27 years and was 51 years old when he died. He left Odina all alone out in the jungle. So oh, <laughs> by this point, the Japanese government had assumed everyone they thought was holding out was dead. It had been nearly 20 years since the last holdout was killed. And they declared Odina and his group of uh, the rest of his group dead 13 years earlier. The family had even a ceremony at the Yasukuni shrine, a shrine that is not problematic at all. Don't bother nope. Googling it. Don't, don't, don't worry about that. But when the cops discovered the guy they killed was actually a Japanese dude out in the forest, not just some bandit, it sparked new interest in the men. If Kazuka was still alive, they figured, Odina might be too. So more search parties were sent to look for him, including his own father, who like yelled out into the jungle with a bullhorn, like, come oh, back God. home! That's gotta be fucking depressing. Yeah, uh, and Odina said that his dad must be working for the Americans. Uh, enter a college dropout named Norio Suzuki. Uh, as all good things are, uh, that start with college dropouts. Uh, I assume it, if it wasn't the 70s, uh, Suzuki could have just started a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, Suzuki was a weird fucking guy. Uh, he ran away from school, declaring it, it and Japanese society as fake, uh, and uh, decided in 1974 to dedicate his life to finding Lieutenant Odina, a panda, and a yeti in that order. In that order. I saw, I read that, yeah. <laughs> Suzuki found Odina just four days after looking for him and was almost immediately uh, uh, almost shot, right? Uh, Odina pointed his rifle at him and Suzuki called out, Odina-san, the emperor and the people of Japan are worried about you. At which Aww. point, according to Odina, it saved his life because he was going to kill him. <laughs> 
Oh, Jesus. Now, according to Odona, the two men became fast friends, despite originally dismissing Suzuki as, quote, a hippie kid. Uh, which is interesting. That I'm assuming that he is, uh, he is taking some things he learned after moving back to Japan later in life and then applying them to Suzuki. Yeah, retroactively. Retroactively, because how the fuck would he know what a hippie is? That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, as Suzuki was a deeply weird man, we can probably assume Odona would just really fucking lonely and was fine sitting out in the jungle and talking to this guy uh, after his last friend got shot by the cops. Uh, Suzuki told Odina that the war was over and for the first time it really did seem like Odina believed it. But according to Odina, a soldier could not leave his post without orders from a superior commander. Because if, Tanagu- <laughs> if you remember Tanaguchi was like, do not fucking leave these ju- right. this jungle unless I back. tell you. Right? Um, so Suzuki snapped a couple pictures of the two men together, which showed Oda still wearing his Imperial Army uniform and carrying oh. his standard issue air soccer what rifle. That that perfectly. Like? Oh, it had to be terrible. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe he dried it or washed it and dried it on a branch while he just hung around naked. I don't know. His <laughs> rifle was still flawless in perfect working order. We know this because Suzuki carried it around and he allowed him to shoot it. Wow. And he still had uh, hundreds of rounds of ammunition. How much did they have to start with? Uh, I think thousands. Okay, all right. Uh, Suzuki took the pictures as proof of life and found the lieutenant's uh, old uh, commander, Major Taniguchi. Now, Taniguchi at this point was very elderly and working in a bookstore because apparently the Imperial Japanese uh, military's pension system fucking sucks. (laughs) Uh, like everyone else, Taniguchi thought Odina and all of the men that he had left behind were long dead uh, because you know, Japan lost just so many people during the war. Like, who is, what is four more, right? Sure. Um, using that photograph, Suzuki convinced Taniguchi to travel with him back to Lubang and officially o- order Odina to end his personal one-man World War II. Mm-hmm. When they got to the island, they met with Odin on 11 March 1974, who emerged from the jungle in his dress uniform, wearing his ceremonial sword and carrying his rifle. Taniguchi read the following orders. In accordance with the Imperial Command, the 14th Area Army has ceased all combat activity. In accordance with Military Command Orders Number A2003, the Special Squadron Staff Headquarters is relieved of all military duties. Units and individuals under the command of Special Squadron are to cease military activities and operations immediately and to place themselves in the command of the nearest superior officer. When no officer can be found, they are to communicate with the American or Philippine forces to follow their directives. With that, Odina officially surrendered, turning his sword over to Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos, uh, something that is captured on film and, man, does it look weird. (laughs) I saw a still from that. I was just like, what the fuck? Uh, Marcos uh, also gifted Odina with a pardon uh, because over the years he was responsible for killing around 30 ish people on the island of Lubang. What a dick! What a dick! (laughs) Not to mention, I assume, millions of dollars worth of property damage. Um, This did not make the people of the island very happy. Uh, But when he finally turned over his rifle, Odina cried over it uncontrollably. I assume because, much like Wilson in Castaway, this is all he had left. That's fair. I, I think crying uncontrollably is fair. Yeah. You've been, you've been just up to your own dick and your own filth for 27 years. Like, Yeah. Yeah. Now you're damn near an old man and you're returning to a country that like... You don't granted, recognize. I know, I know like Japanese people had to deal with a lot of shit after World War II, but like imagine skipping over all of that and dropping into 1970s era Japan. Like, Right. That's why they have to put like North Korean defectors in a special camp <laughs> before they let them back out <laughs> into South Korean society. <laughs> All right, good luck to you. <laughs> yeah, when Odin returned to Japan, he was treated like a hero and is given decades of pack- back pay. Now, if that sounds great, I should point out that a lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial Army only made $16 a month, and that sucked even for the time. Uh, for a comparison, an American private made $50 a month. <laughs> Yeah. Now, Odina refused his back pay, and when people gave him money, he donated it to the shrine that he was once honored at, where they thought he was dead. Um, the non-problematic can, shrine where nothing bad happened, now, yes. Yeah, you can take that as, oh, he's helping keep, uh, you know, do upkeep at a shrine that honors war criminals, or like, you know, these, like, I took up space there, and I shouldn't have, uh, have some money. Uh, 
Though, remember, Japanese people and society and had decades to slowly pull themselves away from the, uh, you know, the philosophy, society, and government that led to their brutal spread of imperialism and war throughout Asia. Odina didn't. He was dropped into hyper-capitalist Japan in the 1970s, fresh from what he thought was World War II. And God damn, did he fucking hate it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I read that, that he was just like, basically the kids are all pussies and soft, and then he moves to Brazil. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he, to be fair, he hated um, how like materialistic society had gotten, but he also really fucking hated being treated like a celebrity everywhere he went. He could not go anywhere without people like running over and talking to him. So he disregarded people begging for him to run for government and said, fucked off to Brazil where he raised cattle instead. Uh, though he eventually did return to Japan uh, periodically. He opened a survival and nature appreciation school for Japanese youth uh, because, I mean, he grew up in a pretty rural area, an area that is now a rather large city. Uh, so like, you know, people are losing touch with the wilderness, I guess, if you're him. So I guess being in touch with the wilderness is all this dude knew. So, you know, whatever. Now, unfortunately, his wife did get involved in politics. Uh, she, got in, she got involved with and joined the woman's wing of the Nippon Kagi, uh, which is Uh-oh. an incredibly right-wing group dedicated to returning Japan to the times of the empire. Uh, now, thankfully, Shinzo are, Abe is one of their advisors. Yes. Uh, you may know him as former prime minister of Japan. <laughs> twice. Twice. Yes, he was twice. prime minister two times. <laughs> and he only recently stepped down to the health concerns. What a fun um, country. Yeah. Well, Odina probably agreed with much of this politics and all of the things they stood for. He never participated in it, Uh, which so like credit to him, I suppose. He absolutely could have used that to his advantage. Um, Odina finally died in 2014 from a heart uh, from a heart attack. Oh, uh, so remember uh, to Norio Suzuki, the the guy who wanted to find Odina. Mm -hmm. Remember with the the last part of his thing that he wanted to find a Yeti? Yeah, did he find one? He died looking for a Yeti. He died in the avalanche him, in 1988. <laughs> died, doing, died, died doing what he loved. You gotta respect game recognized game, man. The, the, he was nothing if not dedicated. Now, most people think of Odina when it comes to uh, holdouts, but there was one guy who lasted longer. Uh, Tahiro Nakamura. Now, that's not his name. Uh, he was born with the name Sunio, and he was... Uh, from Ami's descent, and he was indigenous Taiwanese. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately for him and all of the people of his island uh, that fell under imperial Japanese control, he was drafted into the, the imperial army. Like most uh, non Japanese people in the empire, he was forced to take a Japanese name, which is why he comes up as Nakamura. He was shipped off to Morotai Island, which is now part of Indonesia. And he got to the island right before the Allies invaded and took the island in September of 1944. The battle was pretty brutal. Uh, and then Japanese military simply declared all of the missing soldiers uh, on uh, Morota Island to be dead, which included Sunio. Sunio said that he was pretty much immediately separated from his unit. Uh, at no point, like, uh, like the last guy, was he like, oh, we have to scamper off into the woods and live together. He never saw anybody else. Uh, oh Arnold, god so he was a monk <laughs> yeah he he quite literally returned to monk <laughs> he, he disregarded modernity <laughs> returned to monkey that's fucking and, funny and honestly it gets closer to that being the case as we go on so he had a rifle a cooking pot and a knife that's all he had he had oh, no shit. survival training like odina he was just a draftee just a um, guy literally just a guy yeah uh Unlike Odina, it was not loyalty to his officers or the emperor that kept him in hiding. Instead, it was terror. So, like many soldiers, uh, he had been told stories that he believed of, like, the horrible torture and shit that would fall upon him if the Americans got their hand on him and he surrendered. Sure. So, he stayed hidden, cooking only at night so people couldn't see the smoke and in, like, a deep hole so you couldn't see the flame. He says uh, his upbringing in the mountains and relative poverty provided him the will and ability to survive so long. Uh, Like he said, quote, I calmly stayed alive there. Although I didn't have anybody to talk to, I buried deep in my heart. uh, There seemed to be a glimmer of hope and expectation. The only trace of happiness during this time came from the fact I was still alive and I hadn't lost my sense of existence yet. Man, that is dark. (laughs) Right? 
Jesus, that's dark. Can you imagine, dude, just fucking off to a jungle for 29 years and you don't see anyone and you're like, oh, better cook at night. So, like, at some point, <laughs> I would start cooking in broad daylight, just like, shoot me or whatever. At least it's another human being. Like, I do not have the tenacity for that. No, absolutely not. I would have surrendered immediately. Oh, that's oh, like yeah, whenever like, I hear about these last stands and stuff. Yeah, I'm a huge pussy. Take, do what you do. Or the guys holding up to torture and not telling interrogators, but you're like, you just have to threaten me with torture, man. I'll tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> uh, now, Sunio's only clothes was the, the uniform on his back, uh, and it deteriorated over time. So that ended with him literally running around the jungle naked. Oh, so that answers that question. You know, hey, rock out with your cock out, Joe. He's running around in the forest, butt naked, carrying an Arasaka rifle. Though uh, he did find a like a U.S. Army jacket, like in a garbage can at one point, and he used it to cover himself at night. Ah, okay. Most of his time was devoted to finding food and farming. He grew sweet potatoes, beans, bananas, and sugar canes in a personal garden, and gathered roots and fruits, and trapped boar, pheasant, and other birds. So, like, he's living his best life. He's fully returned to monkey. Good for him. Good for him. Quote, not to lose my life became my only goal, and that exhausted most of my time, he said. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, he thought the war was still going on due to constant air traffic over the jungle. He thought that these were bombers or transport planes. Uh, was this mostly you know, freight stuff? It's, it's actually worse than that. Oh, no. He had no idea that the place that he had decided to pop up his camp was right next to an Indonesian Air Force base. Oh, okay. You know what? I get the fear. I get the fear. So he thought that this random air base that's, you know, doing Air Force stuff for decades, like, oh, God, the war must be still going on. Look at all these planes. Uh, And he realizes that he fucked up. He said, quote, I made one simple wrong judgment and it cost me 30 years. Fuck. He accidentally thought the war was still going on. Oh, buddy. And he never got in gunfights with anybody. From all, from what I can tell, he didn't even use his rifle to hunt, thinking like the the sound would carry. The sound and give would, away. would ca- Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He didn't scamper off with an ammunition store either. Like he just had the, the ammo that was on him. Literally just surviving. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, reports of a crazy naked armed man uh, <laughs> running <laughs> through the nearby jungle began to spread. Yeah. Unlike fair Odin. Unlike Odina, he had no want or desire to continue the war. He only used his rifle to hunt occasionally and never once attempted to hurt anyone. So nobody ever knew he actually existed. After reports of him got out, the Indonesian army sent a patrol out to find him chopping wood naked outside of the hut that he had built. Oh, what's up, guys? (laughs) Now here here comes another problem. Nobody had any idea where the fuck to send him. The Emperor of Japan, or the Empire of Japan, didn't exist anymore. And Japan did not exactly have a great relationship with its former colonial subjects, Korea. Uh, while they begrudgingly allowed him to come to Japan if he wanted, Sunio turned them down and said deciding to go back to Taiwan, which was also not a great choice. Since the end of World War II, Mao's communist forces had taken, you know, mainland China, mm. sending the nationalist forces of the Kuomintang fleeing to Taiwan. Once there, those nationalist powers uprooted and treated the aboriginal population like fucking shit, oppressing them and forcing them to take Chinese names now rather than Japanese or their indigenous names. Cool. Another problem is they figured he must have been a Japanese loyalist on top of being a race of people they saw below them, despite the fact that he had been drafted because the formation he was a part of was called the Volunteer Army. It was not volunteer. No. No. Now, Japan also refused to pay him his back pay or a pension. Oh, suck a dick! Give the man his money! Give him his money! He just sucked. He he was just naked in a jungle for 30 years. But eventually they relented, paying him a few hundred dollars after people pointed out how shitty that was. People also donated thousands of dollars to him every year, enough of him to live off of and never needing another job. Now, unfortunately, his wife had remarried and his parents were dead and all of his children couldn't remember who he was. Oh, Oh, Jesus. And what is even weirder is like the guy who married his wife and his wife were like, oh, I guess we have to get a divorce now. And like they were getting ready to like separate. And he was like, no, you you guys are fine. I get it. It's it's fine. You don't have to like remarry me now that I'm alive. Christ, that's depressing. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, it, like he read he was reading about himself in newspapers by a Chinese name that he didn't know was his because like the the Kuomintang forced everybody to have Chinese names. Sure. And he's like, who's this guy? Uh, <laughs> now, uh, despite the fact that Sunio came out of the jungle a few months after Odana, nobody in Japan gave a shit. And in fact, Sunio never once visited the country. This is almost certainly because he was not only an enlisted man or a drafted conscripted man, but a racial minority in a colonial fighting unit of a horribly racist imperial power. And Odona was an officer and a Japanese man. Even weirder is that like he managed to rent an apartment that was like down the street from his ex-wife. And like he, <laughs> he just he just like hung out over there all the time because he didn't know anybody yeah, else. Yeah, and like what else is he supposed to do? He's been running around butt ass naked in the jungle for 40 fucking years. I would like to think when the sun went down in like Taipei or whatever, he just stripped naked and ran, ran around for old times. Oh, they're just like, honey, what are you doing? <laughs> just like uh, grabs then, a rifle, goes to the club. He's not shooting anybody. He just likes to, to, to watch. My man just wants to hang out. <laughs> uh, then he died five years later after returning home from lung cancer. Sunio's life is an unfortunate story. Yes. Now, after this, weird stories of possible holdouts continued to pop up from around the former Japanese empire. And as searches for them continued over the years, they found evidence that some did exist, but had died in some way. Like, for instance, like there was two holdouts that uh, went from being Japanese imperial holdouts to joining a communist insurgency in Malaysia. As you do, just, you know, it's like the checks with that train, man. Just like, oh, I'll fight for whoever. I don't give a fuck. He's like, wait, we get to shoot British people still? Hell yeah. Sign my um, ass up. Yeah, like, it's just like, you know, and the, it's so funny because of how much Imperial Japan fucking hated communists. And these guys are like, yeah, fuck it, whatever. Um, what happens in the jungle stays in the jungle. <laughs> um, and like, it, like we talked about before them becoming boogeymen, like that kind of happened where there was like bandits in certain areas. Like in mm-hmm. 2005, in a remote area of the Philippines, they were reporting that there was Japanese holdouts in the mountains. And, like, there's no way this would have been fucking true. They would have been in their 80s and 90s at that point. Yeah, right. So that's pretty much impossible. Yeah, the concept of a Japanese holdout has gone from real thing to, like, weird human cryptozoology. Also, it's (laughs) a a weird minor plot point in Just Cause 2, I think. Is it? Yeah, you, like, visit an island that might be uh, occupied by... uh, it is just cause too by like a Japanese holdout. It's weird, man. That's so weird. I didn't expect that. And it's good, but like, <laughs> uh, and like they, uh, there were so many stories coming out uh, that like they were still sending like teams out to look for these guys, uh, like forty fucking years after the war is over. And there's no way these guys are still alive, <laughs> or like fifty, yeah. sixty years after the war is like you're, you're gonna find. Like, I don't know, like a Japanese retirement home deep into Moratai Island. Like, oh, hi, guys. Uh, it's just weird. Uh, but we do a segment on this show, Liam, called yes, Questions from Joe. the Legion. And I, one day I will have a drop for this, and I don't. So I'll just use this. <laughs> uh, oh, I was this bump. I was ready, man. <laughs> today's question from the Legion is, if you could go to one time period in all of history... And you could give out an AK-47 and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. Where would you do it? Battle of Antietam. <laughs> uh, Just no, give it to it. one guy who doesn't feel strongly one way or another and see what happens to the street. Renaissance, uh, the, re- the high Renaissance, 1650s Florence. Again, just to see what happens. I have to skip the easy question, say 1915 Armenia. But uh, mm, Warsaw Ghetto. Yeah, thanks. We'll take it. It's just you and me, and it's a handshake meme. <laughs> just like, look, don't ask questions. Here's the AK. Here's a couple crates of ammo. If you need me, uh, I don't know. I'll be in the back. And- I'll, be, yeah. I'll be pooping. <laughs> Click my heels together with my fucking <laughs> time machine and vanish. You're taking AA flack from Nazis with your uh, as you disappear through the air. For some reason, one of the most popular names like amongst Jewish people is your first name now because you gave them an AK. <laughs> I have, I have a, a fucking um, righteous amongst nations in my statues just holding an AK over my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta get it. You, then you can emigrate to Israel if you want. Uh, you go from one genocidal apartheid state to another. <laughs> What's oh, up? Oh, no. 
God, nah, I gotta do it. You, t- you said genocide. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. All right. Well, Liam, thanks for joining us on the on this bonus episode. Everybody, thank you for supporting the show. Uh, and I guess until next time, just like maybe listen to someone when they say the war's over. Yeah. Also, listen to Lions Led by No Fuck. Well, there's <laughs> your your Lions Led by... <laughs> listen to Well, there's your problem. Listen. To, also, listen to Lions Led by Donkeys. Listen, listen to lines led by problems. Problems led by donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> problems, le- problems led by donkeys is just something that sounds like if you had a very specific animal related therapist. Uh, yeah, let's. Um, mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Anyway, all right. Uh, the end. <laughs>